So welcome, everybody. Um, and thanks for coming out on this brutally cold night in the middle of exam period. It's actually really lovely to see you all here, despite the, as they say in this trade, barriers to entry. Um, so I'm Terry Fisher. I'm the director of the Berkman Center. Um, and it's my honor to introduce Susan and this wonderful book. Uh, many of you undoubtedly know something about her background, but for those of you who don't, uh, Susan has been extraordinarily accomplished in a re remarkably wide array of settings. So after a um, dazzling academic career and a clerkship, um, at Yale Law School, not Harvard Law School, as it turns out. Um, she went on to um, stardom in private practice, became a partner at um, the predecessor to the current firm, Wilmer Hale. Um, and then let's see, moved from there to um, ICANN, if I get the sequence right. She was a member of the board of directors of the organization that from an international standpoint, manages, not too effectively, but manages the internet, then moved into an academic setting, became a professor at the University of Michigan Law School, um, gave it up in order to run the um, transition team, um, specifically with respect to telecommunications policy between the Bush and Obama administrations, then became for two years, I think, the chief advisor to Obama in this area, uh, and then returned to teaching, uh, where she is currently now dividing her time between the Kennedy School and Harvard Law School, and last but not least from my standpoint, has graciously agreed to join the board of directors of the Berkman Center. So if you've kept track here, there's traditional academic training, high profile, profile private practice, um, tenured positions at major law schools, and one of the chief um, policymakers in government. Pretty extraordinary array of accomplishments. And you can see the diversity of her background in this remarkable book. So as we will hear in more detail in just a minute, um, it contains all sorts of things. Sort of the core message that at least I've been trying to extract from it is um, a devastating indictment of US broadband policy. Uh, so specifically, it points out uh, the sad state of affairs that we're currently in, in which compared to many other developed countries, we have relatively slow speeds, high prices, differential treatment of uploads and downloads, and um, a failure to respect the principles of network neutrality, the um, obligation of carriers to respect neutrality and what they carry. That's bad compared to where most countries are. And the book tells in great richness the story of how we came to this state of affairs. So along the way, one of the ancillary benefits of the richness of the narrative is that there's grist in this book for reflection upon even bigger themes. Uh, so here are a few of them. Um, Determinacy or indeterminacy in history? Is this narrative inexorable or contingent? Sometimes reading this amazingly detailed account, you get the feeling that there's this irresistible tide, at least in deregulated America, toward this sad state of affairs. But sometimes you get the feeling of, it all could have come out differently if we had less um, earnest players in Comcast, for example, less um, uh, 
fractious behavior among the key players. Little choices that might have proved critical. What if Michael Eisner had actually referred the issue to his board? So determinacy versus indeterminacy, great stuff in this fantastic case study to reflect on that. Um, another big theme that the book provides fantastic material for is whether the United States is capable of digging ourselves out of this hole, whether our combination in this country of um, suspicion of governmental engagement in the supply of public services is, um, will hobble us forever. Um, and the last of the things that, reading through this, seems um, intriguing is uh, how powerful is scholarship? So if you read this book, which I hope all of you will, some things are going to become perfectly clear. So for example, I just checked on my computer to see, is there file service in my hometown? I'm currently a Comcast subscriber, and I'm embarrassed by it now. So some personal implications of this argument are apparent. But if the book has the audience it deserves, so much bigger questions would be on the table. Will government administrators take her argument to heart and transform? So an optimistic view, which I cling to, is that the great strengths manifest in this book will earn it a very wide readership and will help to overcome the blockages that have beset us thus far. So please join me in welcoming Susan Crawford and her fantastic <laughs>Many thanks to Terry for that very generous introduction and uh, to the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Law School for bringing me here and to all of you for coming out on this very cold night. Um, to Caitlin Howarth, who's sitting here, she's right, raise your hand, Caitlin, read through this book many times and helped me put it together. I'm very grateful. And also to uh, Mitchell Shapiro, who the Berkman Center uh, has helped fund, who's uh, helped me a lot with the presentation for tonight. I'm very grateful to all of you and, and to them. I've been trying to tell this story for a long time, and I feel that I'm not getting the message across adequately. And I want to be as clear as possible. This is a sort of inconvenient truth for telecom. So instead of a collapsing ice flow behind me, just imagine a very badly maintained copper wire, <laughs> right? Because telecom needs its own movie. It really does. It's a subject that touches everybody in America and has salience for every policy issue we care about in this country. But we don't seem to be able to grapple with it adequately. And I'm convinced that complex policy issues can be put across on the big screen. I'm convinced of this because Water rights, water rights, was the subject of Chinatown. And all they had to do was add murder and incest. And it was a huge, huge hit. So um, this is our challenge, to make this, somehow make this book into a movie, somehow reach as many people as possible. For the moment, it's just a book. So who am I? Can I see this? Yeah. Um, I'm not a political person at all. I was right out of law school when I went to work for a tiny firm in Los Angeles that published The Computer Lawyer. I remember the very first email message I ever got. I remember how odd it looked. I remember that little at signal. Who was using that? What was the point of that? And I also remember I, I moved to Washington to be a, a, an associate at Wilmer Cutler. I remember the very first website I ever went to. And here it is. It was, it's a Santa Monica beach house. And I'm from Santa Monica. And these are some 20-somethings in the house. And I distinctly remember the moment I clicked on this link and I was able to interact with them. It was as if the back of the computer had fallen away. It was like the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. It was magical. And I grew up as a musician. I'm from a very gentle, scholarly family. And I deeply understood uh, the idea behind the internet of being a place where you couldn't be bossed around. 
and Wikipedia is really the, the symbol of this, where it was a boss-free zone. We were all going to flourish as human beings, communicating globally, um, finding access to resources that had been unimaginable before that. So the advent of the internet in my life was the most exciting intellectual moment. And it has shaped me ever since. It's the thing that, it's the most important development in my lifetime. And I have decided to uh, continue along the path of caring about it a great deal. In 2008, I was a freshly tenured professor at the University of Michigan Law School. I was on the ICANN board. And I was in Cairo with, for my last meeting. ICANN, in order to pretend that it's not American, meets all over the world. And uh, I, I suddenly got a phone call. Uh, the president had just been elected. And I was asked to serve on the transition team. And I hadn't been involved in the campaign at all. And it was 3 o'clock in the morning. And I jumped up and down because I was so delighted at the opportunity to serve this young president and his beautiful family. Remember when they walked out on the stage at Grant Park? I, would, I threw everything overboard. I went to Washington. Friends, family, health, everything went out the window. I was so pleased to get the chance to serve. And I told the transition team I didn't want a job in the administration. I'd just gotten in Ann Arbor. And apparently, that is the secret for getting a job <laughs> in politics, is to tell everybody you don't want a job. It worked. It worked beautifully. And so what happened to me, and then when they ask you to serve, everybody, you have to serve. You have to do it. No choice. right? So in the year that followed that, it wasn't two years. It was just a year. Um, I was on the National Economic Council staff. I got to know the telecom players extremely well. I got to know the landscape. And I became deeply concerned that when it comes to internet access, America is being bossed around by a very few players who have enormous political heft in the capital. And their goals don't align with the goals of the public. They're not evil. In fact, they're great American companies. But their motives and goals are to serve their shareholders and to make as high profits as possible. I also became deeply worried that there was an enormous amount of self-deception in Washington and confusion and just misunderstanding, ignorance about what the internet was, what was happening in the marketplace for internet access, and what the levers of power were that the uh, administration had. It was also very clear to me that there was, ap there was no upside to anybody in the whole system in DC in making plain what was going on. Because as Larry Lessig keeps reminding us, it's, it's money that fuels this whole thing. And since 1989, AT&T has given much more money to the, the political system than Goldman Sachs. The telecom companies are way ahead when it comes to contributions. They also have employees in every single district. There is no upside to, dis to getting in the way of the status quo from their standpoint. It's a difficult set of issues to explain, this internet access question. It's like, it's like an iceberg. It's this enormous, multifaceted, cold, smooth thing. It's glassy. It's hard to get your arms around. And it's rolling over the landscape and flattening everything in front of it. So, Boiling it down to a soundbite and explaining to people what, what was going on uh, seemed very important to me. And I was distressed that these companies, Verizon, Time Warner, Cable, AT&T and Verizon, are very practiced at the art of the politics of personal destruction. If they could, they would smear anybody who tries to disrupt their marketplace. And so I decided it was important to write a book about this. And I decided that it was extremely important not to have any commercial ties to companies in this field. So I have no clients. I'm grateful that I'm an academic, that I can uh, live on my academic salary. Um, and I get little consulting requests. And every time I get them, I think, aha, this is one of these guys trying to trap me. Um, <laughs> I, you know, and I interviewed dozens of people for this book, and almost none of them was willing to speak on the record. There is an enormous amount of fear about this policy issue. Uh, these companies are, are genuinely powerful. 
<laughs> I tried very hard to get an interview with David Cohen, who I profile in the book. He's the consigliere behind Comcast. He's a brilliant political um, activist for Comcast. And I suddenly got a call back. You know, David will have lunch with you on May 4th. And I accepted with glee. I said, great, this is my chance to interview David Cohen. Turns out he was actually calling the other Susan Crawford, the one who works for AT&T. <laughs> Not me, because it's in their interest not to engage with me at all. Um, and so one of the purposes behind writing the book is to make sure that these arguments at least have to be responded to uh, by the people in the industry. So there are a number of ways to tell this story, and there are very few dates I'm going to impose on you. Here, here are the two. Um, I've learned that unless the public demands of Congress that things change, nothing happens, and that no one has the courage to act, the downside is too great. In 1984, the Department of Justice had a lot of courage, and it broke up AT&T, the phone monopoly, because AT&T Ma Bell was refusing to allow long-distance competition. That move led to lower prices for long-distance phone calls, and uh, the idea of both that divestiture and the 96 Telecom Act that followed that was that we would have competition across shared facilities for basic communications. And that, you know, it would be reasonably priced and everybody would get access. You should know that at the beginning of this story, America had the leading phone system in the world. It was our pride. It was our joy. Everybody had access at a reasonable cost. And uh, the idea of basic communications as a utility uh, was part of this 1984 divestiture. And the, and the 96 Act enshrines these principles. That's it for the dates. If you read the book, you'll see there's a lot left to this history. Uh, but we really tried in legislation to do it. So 1984 was also the year I graduated from college. So I'm about to turn 50. And life is short. And I might as well get in the way. <laughs> I've decided that um, I, there's no chance I'm getting another political office after this book. So I might as well uh, push along. All right, well, since then, since the passage of the 96 Act, two things have happened. One is that internet access has replaced telephony as the basic utility that we all use for everything, for all communications. So as Verizon and AT&T uh, push away from voice, what they're really going towards is data and internet access. Same thing for Comcast and Time Warner. So that's the first thing. And the second thing in America is that we've released the providers of these basic utility services from either competition or oversight. They are unconstrained in their activities in the field. Two important developments. At the same time, there's been enormous consolidation on both the wired and wireless sides of these marketplaces. They've consolidated, they've cooperated. So the story I'm about to roll out for you is that uh, cable controls wires. Verizon and AT&T control wireless. These are two separate markets. They're complementary with an E. The rich in America are paying more and more for internet access. They're getting gouged, and they're paying lots of additional fees, device fees, all kinds of crazy things. It's just gravy. They can be added on. There's no, there's no constraint. Um, and the access that even the rich are getting in America isn't as good as what's available worldwide, which is a symmetrical, which means equally powerful download and upload uh, connection over fiber. The middle class and the poor people in America are getting second class treatment. AT&T and Verizon are arguing that all anybody really needs is a wireless connection. And that's getting more and more expensive. And the poor are just left out. So in my great city of New York, 2.2 uh, million people don't have internet access. You know, one of the leading cities of the world, oh, they're just left out. It's just too expensive. Just too expensive. And that raises all of our costs, raises the cost of government, ends up uh, heightening inequality in America. And at the same time that all this is going on, there is a deregulatory battle raging in America. So that uh, just there's that saying about the Holocaust, they came for everyone else, but not for me. And then later they came for me. What's going on in, in the states is a huge effort by the telcos to eliminate any state oversight of their wireless activities, one by one, picking them off. And they're heading for the feds as well. And so now, when people from Korea and Japan and Sweden come to America, they feel puzzled. Everything slows down. 
you know, we think of ourselves as sort of zippy Americans. I've got something to tell you, it's just not the case. Not the case when it comes to this particular issue. This isn't just about national competitiveness. It's also about civic life. So in 2007, uh, the BBC published this picture. It shows about a dozen young men sitting on concrete bollards. What are they doing? They're studying at night in an international airport parking lot. And why are they going there? They're going there because the electricity to their homes is unreliable. So in order to do their homework, they've got to go to the airport. Well, in the westernmost counties of this state, if you want to get internet access and your kid trying to do your homework, you often have to drive to the local public library. And I see some nodding heads out there. Yes, this is the case in western Massachusetts. And you, you park in your car and open up your laptop and hope, hope that the library has left its wireless hotspot on so that you can access the internet from there. Because there isn't adequate access in western Massachusetts. It doesn't exist. So they're in the same spot, the students in Guinea and the students in western Massachusetts. If you want to today start a new business, apply for a job, get government benefits, you have to have access to the internet. You just can't live in the 21st century without it. So when economists say, well, what's the economic burden? Uh, I'm sorry, what's the economic benefit of having internet access? Just say to one of them, all right, I'm going to take yours away. How do you feel about that? Yeah, how are you going to get your work done without a connection to the internet? So uh, it's the essential utility, and in most other countries, uh, the developed world, it's symmetrical and cheap and not here. So Captive Audience, this book I've written, and oh, thanks goes to Ron Suskind for the title. Great title, right? Captive Audience. Uh, it, it attempts to explain this um, and uh, tells us the story, because Congress in the 96 Act uh, says that the FCC is supposed to make available to all the people of the United States a rapid, efficient, nationwide communication service at reasonable charges. And we're just not doing that. We're depriving people of basic information access when everybody in the civilized world should have the ability to communicate, just as a matter of human dignity, and the ability to access information. And every policy we care about, health, education, national security, all of that depends on access. Those edX courses that we're offering at Harvard and MIT, I bet you kids in Korea are watching those. I'm not, I hope that people in America have the capacity to watch them. Not sure. Um, so here's what should happen. We should provide to every American a 30 buck connection. We should be able to do that. We're the, you know, the most innovative country in the world. And where it's too expensive for a private company to provide that, we should be able to build the infrastructure ourselves. We did this with electricity. It's exactly the same story. Electricity uh, used to be provided only by private companies and by very few of them. The industry consolidated, and it took enormous political will over decades to fix that situation. So we're, we're moving in exactly the opposite direction. Um, they're bossing us around, and they really shouldn't be. From the telecom company's point of view, it's our wires, our rules. Our wires, our rules. So here are the facts. Um, about 19 million Americans can't subscribe because there is no access where they are. A third of Americans, 100 million Americans, don't subscribe to high-speed internet access. As Terry said, prices are high, speeds are comparatively slow. Um, cable dominates the wired side, and the Comcast and Time Warner have divided the country. I'll talk about that in a second. They face no real competition other than Fios, which actually is a better service, but available to not very many Americans. A Verizon and AT&T, like bullies in the schoolyard, have retreated to their corner. They're just working on wireless. And we have no plan for a national upgrade to fiber. If you remember nothing else from this presentation, I hope you can see this slide. Hang on to this one, because this is the, the heart of the story. These three columns, if you can see them, are three different definitions of download broadband speeds. So the far left is, let's say, broadband five years ago. Uh, one megabit per second. The middle column is today about 10 megabits per second download, and 25 is broadband of the future to the far right. As you move from left to right, it's sort of a time series. And as you move, you see that uh, the box says two competitors, one competitor. As you go from very slow, uh, one megabit per second, over to 10, DSL drops away. 
There are only three forms of media you need to understand to get this whole book. Uh, it's like um, the, you know, a joke with three prongs. Uh, there's copper, cable, and fiber. Copper wire used for the telephone system has the lowest capacity and is the oldest of the three. Cable, faster, higher capacity, but only for download, not for upload. And then fiber, potentially unlimited speeds, just lasers sending light through it. All right, that is now your technical background for the entire thing, all right? So uh, as we move from one megabit per second download to uh, 10, DSL, which is the uh, portion of the copper line used for higher speeds, drops away. DSL can't provide that capacity. So you know, we're not going to have that. Then in that middle line, there's something called fiber to the neighborhood or fiber to the node. That, that means that there's fiber running to your neighborhood and then copper after that to reach your house. That's what AT&T is offering in its Uverse service. So Uverse provides competition there in the 10 megabit slot. But as we move to the future, where the rest of the world is, where we should be, in 75 to 82% of the country, the only choice for Americans is cable. The only choice, because only in about 14% of America is there Verizon Fios or fiber available. This is stupendous, and I've written articles about this called the looming cable monopoly. Uh, and the FCC will say, well, yes, we agree that the um, cable monopoly exists, but we're not going to do anything about it until there's a pu public outroar, outcry. So the book is aimed at spurring that public outcry. So cable's the last infrastructure standing in about 80% of the country, except where Verizon has built Fios. Wireless will not substitute for this. Wireless is a much lower capacity medium. Here's another chart you might want to remember. Uh, Comcast and Time Warner, uh, a while ago, divided up the country and um, consolidated their operations so that they control whole of markets. Now, New York is pretty big. So in New York, Cablevision has the Bronx and part of Brooklyn and all of Long Island and parts of New Jersey and Connecticut. Time Warner Cable has all of Manhattan and Queens and part of Brooklyn. And Comcast has uh, parts of New Jersey and, and uh, in the NYC metro area. But as you look down the list, these are the biggest areas of the country. It's one major cable company per each area. There is no competition. This happened because 40 years ago, they got uh, exclusive franchises, often by uh, persuading monetarily city council members to hand them those exclusive franchises. Uh, and so even though that's been outlawed since 92, they still have enormous market power there. So cable really stands alone. Not only is it the only choice for the speeds that we need, in most parts of the country, there's only one operator. Boston is one of these places. There, there's a little bit of RCN around the edges. It's like Standard Oil did the same thing. You let a little bit of competition <laughs> exist so you can point to it and say, ha, we're competing. But otherwise, it's, it's mostly controlled by, by one company. And it's very good to be Comcast. Um, they measure their video and broadband revenues together. And this is just a line going up saying the average revenue per customer, they're making more money from the same number of people, keeps climbing and really climbing. So even though the cost of storage is going way down, the cost of computation is going way down, the cost of access and connectivity is continuing to climb. So I'm looking at the reflection of this in the mirror, which is a lot of fun. So here's. Here's the money quote. I was so glad when Brian Roberts said this on an investor call. The type's too small, but it's very moving. He says, the best business we may be in is broadband, not, not video. They're moving gradually away from TV into, into broadband. He said, we're raising our prices, but we still have tremendous sales. That's because you have no choice. And so he says, we're 33 to 31% penetrated. That means that in each part of their footprint, they control as of 2011, a third of the market. But then he says, the goal would be 100 or 90. Comcast is looking for 100% market control of each place where it operates. And then he says, we have one competitor, and that's Verizon Fios. That's it. That's their only competitor. And he says, I really like that position. Yeah, if you're a gatekeeper and you're charging everybody tolls, this looks great. So this, they tell their investors that they're very aware of the market power and, and really ready to go. Now, so why is this happening? What's going on is that people are fleeing those copper wires. So DSL 
offered by AT&T and Verizon, the numbers are way down and uh, the numbers are way up for, for cable. Just for comparison's sake, here's, here are the numbers for fiber. Um, is that right? Yeah. So there are about 5 million uh, subscribers to Fios in America and maybe 6 to Uverse, that fiber to the node service. But those numbers are much lower than what, what cable has at the top there. And Fios, here's the news, is not going to expand. If Terry has it in his neighborhood, he's really lucky. Americans are, um, yeah, it's the final number. There, OK. So Americans are fleeing DSL because it's slow. That's all this slide says. It's really slow. It can't get any faster. That's, it's just a copper wire. And this chart came out yesterday from Netflix showing that, so Google Fiber way at the top, vast symmetrical service, Verizon Files is up there, and then come all the cable services, and then AT&T U-verse, and then way down at the bottom, DSL, and then Verizon Wireless almost falls off the chart. It's at the very, very bottom. So uh, this is the story. When it comes to the speech that America needs and that people want, only cable can operate it. And U-verse, as a result, is not doing terribly well. In the markets where it exists, it only has about 18% penetration where it's been marketed. Uh, Fios, by contrast, where it exists, is uh, doing very well, 36%, 37%. But the, here's why this happened. In order to move from the telco's copper to fiber, you have to actually dig up the streets and install it. That's very expensive. In order to take your existing monopoly cable plant and make it faster, all you have to do is work on the electronics. You don't have to dig up anything. So the upgrade path for cable to get to 100 megabits per second is cheap. The upgrade path for the telcos to get from copper to fiber is expensive. And so Verizon is not going to be expanding this fiber build out. Wall Street hates it because it, it's a lot of capital expenditure. You have to dig things up. And we saw this reflected in the recent non-compete agreement that was blessed by the uh, federal government of the Verizon Comcast deal of 2011-2012. Uh, the result of this deal is that uh, they're going to co-market each other's services, Verizon and Comcast. If you're competing, you don't sell each other's stuff. I think that's pretty obvious. So Verizon said, we'll sell the cable guys wires, and you will sell our wireless services. Now, Verizon said, if we will continue to market Fios in the areas where it exists, but we're not going to expand. It's just, it's just too expensive. So, all right, that's the picture. It's a cooperation moment between Verizon and uh, the cable companies. This means that cable leaves wireless to Verizon and AT&T, and Verizon leaves the wires to Time Warner and Comcast, who themselves have already divided up the country. Okay. And here's the problem. It's, there is competition from Fios. It's a much better service than Doxis 3.0, which is the cable uh, situation. Much more competitive than Uverse. But Comcast only faces competition from Verizon in 15% of its territory. Time Warner faces competition from Verizon in 11% of its territory. That's not very much. And so in most of their footprint, and remember, they've divided up the country. They don't face each other. They don't face any competition. And poor Cablevision, the Dolan's company, has a tough problem around Long Island because they do face a lot of Fios. They actually have to fight for their households. Um, but uh, Time Warner and Comcast don't have to do that. So some really exciting slides coming up. This shows that 94% uh, of um, new ads, new broadband subscriptions in the third quarter of 2012, which is right now, just ended, are going to cable. The line plummeting downward is uh, the telcos. They are losing uh, broadband subscriptions. They used to be about even in the beginning of the, uh, the decade, and now cable is taking off really quickly, and uh, telcos are going way, way down. And this happened because the cable guys did that cheap upgrade, and it was too expensive for the phone company to do it. Not only do they have 94% of the new subscribers, got to love these numbers, it's a 95% profit, profitable product, broadband for cable is all gravy, all gravy, enormous amount of money for them. So another chart uh, showing that broadband subscribers for cable of Time Warner and, and Comcast way up, for the telcos way down. Um, Verizon's doing slightly better on the wireline side of things because they sold off their second rate copper lines. So there are a lot of people in New England who are getting really terrible service. Watch out for them. 
And all this is happening even though everybody hates the cable company and they rate very low on customer satisfaction. You just don't have a, there's no choice. So you're going to sign up with them no matter what happens. And at the same time, Comcast is spending much less money on capital expenditure. They're not expanding. They're not enhancing. They've done their investment. They're just harvesting at this point. That's what CapEx is. So it continues to decline unbelievably low. It's down to 14% capital expenditures uh, in comparison to their revenue. So lots of money coming in, very little going out for investments. And at the same time, their free cash flow climbs. So capital expenditure goes down. All their cash goes up. You see all the arrows are going in the right direction. Life is very good if you're Comcast. And what's happening to that money is that it's supporting the stock price. Enormous amounts of revenue are going in back to the shareholders showing again that this is a harvesting moment. The shareholders do very well. The rest of the country, not so great. Um, this final chart shows that both cable and wireless in their separate parts of the schoolyard are doing extremely well. Uh, there's something like 40% of the money they make is just gravy, just free cash flow at this point. So this is a capital intensive business, big barriers to entry, got to pour a lot of money into it initially. But cable has a monopoly. Wireless basically is a duopoly between AT&T and Verizon. And so they're in harvesting mode. They can just charge whatever it is they want. And consumer demand is relatively inelastic. So moving over to the wireless marketplace, you see you don't even have to read the book. I'm going to tell you what's in here because I want you all to become evangelists for this set of issues. So here's the wireless marketplace. The two dominant players together, Verizon and AT&T, have about uh, two thirds of the subscribers. but the 80% of revenues and 85% of the income. These are giants in the field. They're, they really control wireless. And you can see this from uh, just this recent quarter. So Verizon and AT&T together added more than 2.3 million retail customers. The next three largest, Sprint, T-Mobile, PCS, lost almost a million customers. So uh, there we go. So there's huge growth for Verizon and AT&T and losses for the other guys. And uh, what you really care about if you run these things is churn, if people are leaving you or not. Nobody's leaving AT&T and Verizon. You're all stuck into these long-term contracts. You love your iPhone. By contrast, people are leaving the other players in a big way. And a clue to the reason that Verizon and AT&T are so powerful is that they have all of the low band spectrum, which allows them to build fewer towers, which is cheaper. So they can provide nationwide service uh, much more cheaply than T-Mobile and everybody else can because they got these licenses. The book explains how they got them. And that's, this gap is really impossible to bridge, although there is new investment flowing into Sprint at this point, uh, which, which may make a difference, but I doubt it. It's a, it's a really controlled marketplace right now. So uh, the net of this is that wireless, as a share of the revenue for both AT&T and Verizon, is climbing dramatically. They're giving up on their wires. They're moving entirely into wireless. And this is leading to a very dramatic change in the free cash flow. These, liar, these lines cross. It used to be that wire line was really important. Now it's not at all. Wireless is now the source of what's uh, going on for the telcos. So you know your aunt probably thinks of the telephone company as providing telephone wires. But it's really not doing that anymore. It's mostly selling wireless services. And for those of you who care about comparisons, Here's a really great picture. This one and the first one are really the most important. This shows that in America, average revenue per user uh, for wireless services is just up and up and up. In Europe, it's going down. Easy to understand, not too quantitative. We can do this, right? It's things, these are two very different worlds. Much more competition in Europe, hardly any here in America. So you can get. Uh, a gigabit of data and unlimited minutes and texts in Europe for about, you guys are going to hate this, $12 a month. <gasps> a, comparable service, a comparable service in the US goes for uh, either 50 bucks for a bring your own uh, device, T-Mobile device, or $90 for Verizon, $90 a month. So people who come here from other countries are just perplexed, like what is going on here? Why? My colleague from France here at the top, right? Why is this so expensive? What's going on? OK. Um, so it, it, the impact here is, is a relative lack of competition. And the Wall Street Journal, Anton Troinovsky is doing a wonderful job writing about this, that cell phone, smartphone subscriptions are just eating up family budgets. It's so much money. 
And it, it's inelastic. You really don't have a choice. If you're, you're going to live in the world, you're going to need a phone. And uh, it's, people are perplexed as to how they're going to go on. Even as we're spending less and less for entertainment, clothing, and meals out, we're spending more and more for wireless. Why? Because it's, it's a utility. You need it in order to survive. So um, can't see, do I got this? Oh, one more. This is all about eating the family budget. Now, the goal, so the goals of these companies are clear. Let's make more money from each household. Let's get each household to buy more devices. This is the family plans. Let's charge a lot for overages if you hit a data limit. The new plan is to have toll-free apps so that an application would pay the carrier uh, to be viewed as free by the subscriber. This is a, a new wrinkle on let's price discriminate in ways that help us. And it, because there's no oversight, either at the federal or state level, of these uh, wireless actors, they can do this. Um, and it's working. It's working really well. And so to imagine, based on how Verizon's doing so far, we can imagine how well they might be doing in 2017, not so far away. Um, this, 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 is a, this is a proxy for annual household spending at, in 2017. You can use different growth rates, and the graph does this, either 3.5% to 9.5%. If you, if you had a growth rate of 9.5%, each household will be paying more. Uh, under all these scenarios, it's more than $2,000 a year for wireless access. Each household in America subscribing, paying. Right, can you believe it? $2,000 a year. It's, it's amazing. And even under the slow growth scenario, it would still be $434 a, a month higher than it was in 2011. These increases are whopping. And what allows this to happen is that uh, market power and lack of oversight. Um, so for both of these markets, Wired, I told you all about the cable monopoly, you're convinced. And now the wireless monopoly on the other side, suppressing the demand using caps and overages, rise of these toll-free business models. Someday there will be an internet that's just Facebook and Twitter. And people will say, well, that's the internet. And they get charged nothing by the carriers to reach people. And the book goes into great detail about vertical integration used as a method for um, raising barriers to entry. And then if you really want to think about your holiday cards, um, where's this? There we go. These uh, executives are some of the highest paid in America. And um, for Brian Roberts, he controls all the voting stock of Comcast, too. It's almost like his private investment, even though he owns just 3% of the equity. This really is the Gilded Age all over again for these guys. They, they have enormous power over, over these companies and uh, really no, no constraints. Um, so I'm not getting any holiday cards from any of these guys. I know that. <laughs> But I, I just wanted you to know what it's like out there. This is actually, this is in comparison to their employees' paychecks. It's, it's a thousand X, a thousand X for on the cable side. In most American companies, it's about 380 X. I'm not saying that we're doing great on the inequality metric, but when it comes to these particular media companies that would have been viewed as utilities in the past, it's really striking. So <clears throat> what happened? We believed about 10 years ago that competition would protect Americans, that cable would fight it out with telephony, and the wireless would get in there, and that we didn't need any regulatory oversight. It turns out we were wrong. Cable consolidated, the phone companies gave up, and uh, wireless is not competitive with all these wires. We saw that in the Netflix chart. It's way down when it comes to capacity. We believed that somehow the pixie dust addition of, of internet protocol to these networks would solve the basic economic problems that exist. These are actually natural monopolies. It's very expensive to build them. Costs go down sharply for each marginal customer after, after you've built it. The barriers to entry are insuperable. And everybody needs it. It's a utility that uh, people have to have. To have. We also believed that we could keep wholesale markets in place. This is a big problem with deregulation uh, that the book explores. That we, It's very difficult to get access to a competitive local exchange uh, provider because we've shut down those um, networks. We sort of believed that more stuff would magically show up. And my tech sector is guilty of this. We say, oh, we can just geek around it. Well, you can't geek around this stuff because it's policy that made the internet take off. 
If it hadn't been for the telecommunications structure that required the phone companies to let internet service providers connect to their lines, if it hadn't been for the requirement of common carriage, we wouldn't have an internet. Because they would have charged the way they're charging now for each use of it and for each device and for everything we ever wanted to do. Uh, we were just wrong. We were wrong. And, and the result is that our, our policies are really harming our country. So what's the next step? Well, clearly I need better graphics. <laughs> and I hope that all of you will help me with that. We need to make a movie of this. We also need a better organization. In each congressional district, there should be a group that really cares about this and asks questions at every debate. What are you doing to bring fiber to all Americans? What are you doing to lower telecom costs? What are you doing to make sure that there's some oversight? We had to do it for banking. We should do it for global warming. Why are we not doing it for telecommunications? Um, and I've also listed here the policy steps that have to happen. We have to make sure that cities can help themselves. So there are a bunch of terrible state laws that have been passed by AT&T and others working in the state house. We've got to preempt those. We've got to make sure that there is, in fact, administratively with the FCC control over high-speed internet access. Got to make sure that cities get access to cheap money so they can help themselves. It separate conduit and content. So only NBCU shouldn't help Comcast as much as it does. By the way, the Nixon White House wanted to do this in 1974. They said we should separate out cable from uh, content because it's just too risky if we don't. And we should have some oversight of, of wireless. So and now that's it. It's all up to you. And uh, <laughs> it's going to be a several year battle. If, it, if this ever succeeds at all, it's going to take uh, many people getting involved. This is not just my story. This is all of our stories. And I look forward to working with you and, and talking to you about it. So thanks very much for your attention. You do it. <laughs> We're a team. Yeah, Bhumip Khashnavich, uh, do you think the venture which Google took, uh, you showed in your chart that Google has yep. higher speed. Do you think Google will do it in another area, geographical area? If not, how, what can be done so that uh, other companies like Yahoo, Facebook, you know, things like that, they also yeah. venture into these things. What can be done in terms of policy, administration, and local activities? Thank Terrific. You. That's a great question. So Google's uh, very disruptive move of bringing fiber to Kansas City is the most exciting news in this sector this year. We're all watching it. Now, Google got a lot of concessions from the city of uh, Kansas City that made that possible. It may not be possible for them to replicate the cost structure they created in Kansas City, but what they're doing is embarrassing everybody else. And that's great. So if the rest of the, city, of the country's mayors say, we really want that, they should be able to do it. But here's the problem. In almost 20 states, it's either illegal or very difficult for cities to build fiber networks for themselves because of restrictive state laws that have been passed. So that's why the first bullet for me for next actions is preempting those laws and making it possible. It's a self-determination thing. The, you know, this is not a partisan issue. Republicans should love this, that cities should get to do this for themselves if they want to. Right now, there's enormous opposition. Cities try to do it. They get sued into oblivion. Just ask the Republican mayor of Chattanooga what it was like trying to get his network off the ground. So uh, great question, very disruptive, but right now there's a, there's a the situation is not great for cities that want to do this for themselves. Um, gentleman in the back, you had your hand up earlier on. I live in Somerville, which is the city next to this one. We had a, force, a mayor with some foresight who demanded that there be two competing cable companies serving the entire city. Great. However, the issue of serving the entire city is why we didn't get Verizon Files, because <clears throat> Verizon wanted to be able to come in and serve only part of Somerville. The city insisted that if you were going to come in at all, they had to serve the whole city. There was an impasse, and we never got files. Right. Is this the story of files everywhere? Is this why yeah. files has, has not expanded more? Well, I think the economic story is at the heart of why files hasn't expanded. It just is expensive for them to build. And Wall Street wants these very high dividends, wants that free cash flow to stay up and keep the stock price up, and is unhappy when they invest a lot. But listen to what we're saying. We need to wait for Google. 
We need to wait for Verizon. This is a utility. We don't wait for electricity. We, we come home and we turn it on and it works. How could it, how could it be that we treat this so differently as a voluntary prerogative of a few companies? That, that just seems wrong. Um, here. Um, Susan, a, yeah. a, apart from us becoming a Sweden or a uh, South Korea, which would be amazing, I was wondering what you think some best practices are, in particular if you're familiar with Australia rolling yeah. out the NBN, which has somewhat of a similar history, yeah. or the UK and uh, what's happened with BT. Oh, absolutely. So Australia, uh, we have a sort of a problem in that it doesn't look like we have a monopoly because they're different ones in different parts of the country. In Australia, it's obvious they have a monopoly, which is <laughs> Telstra. But, but they all hate Telstra. Telstra really disliked in Australia. And so uh, the government, the new government came in and ran on wanting broadband in their country. And uh, their few ministers have really devoted their careers to making sure that fiber uh, rolls out in, uh, in Australia. We're hoping that works well. It's, I really hope it succeeds. There are some issues about how, at, how, at what low a level uh, this wholesale fiber uh, access is being made available, and whether there's too much control retained by the incumbent. But again, this is about national industrial policy, and Australia has been able to do that and say, this is important for us. We need to do this for our future. South Korea, same thing. I'm going to Seoul at the end of this month because I'm so curious as to how they did it. But it's often because it's just, we do this. We're a nation. It's important to us. We're going to do it. Um, in the UK, more voluntary, they encouraged uh, BT to separate its, itself into wholesale and retail. Uh, and, and frankly, not as fast speeds. They don't have as much fiber as we would probably like. So read the book. There are lots of international comparisons that are fascinating. And I hope that some of the students here will write about this. And Rob Ferris over here is a real expert in the Berkman Center. Raise your hand, Rob, so everybody sees you. Yeah, go volunteer, work for Rob. And, uh, uh, there's a, a lot to be learned from other countries. Americans, to be fair, don't care about other countries. We just don't care. We did f for Sputnik for about a minute, but since then we haven't, we haven't really paid attention. So that's why Kansas City is so important. We, we can be embarrassed internally, even if we can't be embarrassed globally. I, I think that's not true. I think we're really embarrassed when people beat us out. So we care if somebody else is ahead of us. Okay, so. well, everybody's ahead of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Here in Cambridge, um, oh. here in Cambridge, uh, the the deal with Comcast have in effect a monopoly, and the deal that was negotiated it's a ten year deal. Um, didn't have a lot of, uh, according to the people who the city administration, there wasn't a lot of um, uh, wiggle room for what could be negotiated. But there were there were sessions where people piled on as much as they could with the idea of you know laying down a record that would then lead to some favorable things being part of this 10-year deal. The argument, the claim has always been, in theory there's competition, but Verizon just aren't interested in Cambridge. Yeah. It's hard for me to believe that, first, so it's two questions. It's hard, is it, it's hard for me to believe that nobody else is really interested in, in a market like Cambridge, yeah. first of all. And then the second thing is, well, um, what if, what if the city said, and why couldn't they say, anybody can use the right of the public way, the public right of way. Anybody can be, we can oblige you to share that with other potential competi competitors. And, um, you know, why can't, why can't they, why can't we say to them something like that or require that there be certain things that apparently they claim can't be required like an option, like a public option in healthcare, um, a public, a municipal uh, Wi-Fi uh, to, to parallel what Comcast do? Well, lot, lots of ways to think you. It's a wonderful question. Um, the, there's a failure of policies at the federal level. Because uh, we've deregulated high-speed internet access, we've given no power to cities to demand particular conditions on the franchisees that come in. And here's the terrible conflict of interest. Cities get a kickback, a percentage revenue of video fees that are charged for by cable. 
So my city, New York City, gets $150 million a year, which is very useful if you're running a city, um, to be co coming back from the cable companies to them. So there is actually an incentive to work with the cable industry and not push them too much. Uh, at the same time, no, that's what's so great about it. It can go anywhere, that money. So uh, the problem is you'd have, to, you'd have to wean yourself from that money and push towards finding someone with a deep enough balance sheet that they could make the investments necessary to run the network. Because here's the really terrible problem. There aren't enough players that are rich enough to get the kind of financing you need to build this infrastructure, which is why one of my bullet points is a, sort of an infrastructure bank getting long-term low, low interest financing so that more ordinary players could do this. This is the secret behind doing big things is cheap money, and it's not easily available now. So lot, there are lots of ways to respond to that, but basically the cities don't feel like they have much power. Yeah, how would Harry. Uh, a, a comment and a question. The, 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 the comment is that um, I'm, I would be glad, and I'm sure there are plenty of people around here who would be glad to introduce you to documentary filmmakers. Mm. If you're not already no, we need to do in, that in, in touch. I mean, seriously. I, I need all the help I, I can mean, get. There are probably people who know more than I do, but um, it would make a great documentary. Wouldn't it? Depending if you Murder, could get incest, the right yeah. people on camera, of course. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, so the question is, what percentage of Congress would agree with the proposition? that it's a utility, which you keep hammering and which is the premise for the entire argument you've yeah. laid out. Because I hear, you know, you hear talking heads or writers or, you know, uh, crazy blatherers who people listen to say, you know, being able to watch porn in your, you know, on your, on your TV, on your computer screen is not a basic human right. Yeah. And it's kind of that, this kind of extreme reductionist, dismissive, yeah. you know, and, and we're doing the best we can by giving people high download speeds, and it's only an entertainment medium anyway, for, for the consumer. Right. I mean, at the same time as people say, well, business is something else, but that, that so, so, so my question is, you know, do you, are, are, you know, are you confident, or is there any reason to be confident that the fundamental premise that this is a utility that ought to be like, treated like electricity, we should have, rural electrification, you know, that that premise is accepted. Congress people only respond to pressure from their constituents. And uh, when this issue is out, you know, being discussed online or when people are complaining about their cable company, there's a lot of unhappiness from ordinary Americans who definitely view it as a utility. Like, how am I supposed to run my business? How am I supposed to survive if I don't have this access? That message hasn't been, I believe, adequately delivered to Congress so that today they may say, oh, no, it's a luxury. It's just for, you know, movies. But if they, if we had a way to aggregate and visualize and push on the messages that are actually felt in the middle of the country and by poor people, um, not by us sitting in this room, I think that message could get across. It doesn't feel, you can't build a new business without it. You can't, you know, you can't take care of your, if you want your kid to get educated remotely, you can't do it. You, you know, health, government benefits are moving online. Here's what I hope will move Congress people eventually. Stockholm saw its cost of government communications go down 40% by providing for fiber everywhere. Because all those forms you used to need to fill out and hand in the paper, they go away. You know, the, the reduction in government cost could maybe get, get us. It's such a big sector of our economy. But I'm arguing for rational behavior, and Harry, uh, yes. you know that's, that's not going to happen. You've had your hand up for a while from the back row. Yes, Alex. Hi, thank you. Uh, Alex Remington. I'm a student at the Kennedy School. I took Susan's class. Um, I, I was very struck by uh, the point that you made earlier that in many cases, <clears throat> there are laws on the books that address some of these bad practices especially consolidation of monopoly. Uh, and so it's not merely a matter of necessarily passing laws as right. enforcing and regulating them. So with regard to regulation, um, so recently there was, uh, there's was there been this kerfuffle over the FCC potentially doing away with um, rules prohibiting media consolidation mm -hmm. in given markets. Um, 
So thinking about how to regulate new laws that you would be advocating for, is what we see now more an instance of regulatory capture or ignorance, which is worse, and how do we address whichever it is? There are people of good faith and great intelligence throughout government. They, there is no upside at the moment to taking on this industry. There just isn't. If you're on the Hill, we have two or three champions who understand this and are willing to talk about it. But everybody else could be run out of office if they tried to do something about this. Right. Who are they? Oh, Markey, our, our representative from Massachusetts is wonderful, Ed Markey. Senator Franken absolutely understands this from his background in the media industry. Inchi. What? Inchi. Potentially. Potentially. Sherrod we're Brown. we're Sherrod Brown, potentially. I, I'm looking for more champions, so you know, happy to find them. But most people in Congress, there's no upside. And it's also, it feels like it's a little complicated. You know, there are numbers <laughs> and wires. And you know, I, I don't understand this. So they, they, they get a little delicate. And the other terrible thing is that they don't want to feel dumb. So if anybody asks them a follow-up question, they can't answer it. And that, that's a terrible thing for a senator or a representative. You don't want to be in that position. So all, all the arrows for them are pointing until they get some big push from the public. And their, their votes depend, their ability to get reelected depends on it. They're not going to do anything about it. Now, on the administrative level, you would think you would act proactively. But here's the problem. Verizon and AT&T and, and Comcast and Time Warner are very closely tied to the congressional committees that set the budgets for the FCC, the appropriations group. So if you come in as the FCC chairman, you say, I'm going to take care of this issue you risk having your agency's budget cut in half. And that makes it impossible for you to do all the other things you want to do. So you'd think, all right, I'll be brave, I'll go do it. But you know, when you get in there, it feels differently. There are all these people whose lives depend on you working in the, in the, com in the commission. So we all hope for courage. But uh, this courage needs air cover. It needs public support in order to work. Uh, I'm curious how you address some of the, I mean, I've noticed that the, the cable companies every once in a while will put out these great ad campaigns that show them as great citizens, great employers, yeah. you know, they employ the underserved who aren't getting access to the actual services that they actually provide and fix for all, you know, everyone in Manhattan. And although there's grassroots organizations that are trying to gain that connectivity, the only connection that they have to the major providers is through one or even two or even three intermediaries that are that are brokering those deals. And so at the end of the day, they just get insanely subpar connectivity. And I was curious what tools we could maybe give those grassroots organizations or community organizations that are trying to bridge that gap or trying to make a slightest bit of noise. I don't, I don't know that you have the answer. But. Well, the tool we can give everybody is to get this on the radar screen, just to get it on the radar screen. Just make it a salient issue. Because right now, we've got heroes all across the country who are deeply knowledgeable about this. And they're, they're working in civil society groups. They're in local government. They're in federal government. But they're, they're feeling isolated. They're feeling lonely. They're behind these dusty windows. And so whatever we can do to make this an issue like consumer credit, you know, like the banking industry, that became salient. It just, it took effort. Whatever we can do to make this issue be mainstream. You know, right now, people look at me and they say, oh, that's Susan Crawford, she's just crazy. And I know I'm not crazy, I know I'm right, and we've got all these <laughs> charts showing the money, you know, what, what's happened. But it's possible for them to call me crazy if there aren't a thousand of me. And so it is our opportunity to make this issue mainstream and not, not marginal. That's what's going to change the picture. I've neglected this side. Anybody over? Yeah. Last question. Um, I, I think you prob Thank you. I think you probably laid down why this is a dead end, if a noble idea in the book. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Freedom Pop and uh, their free or freemium wireless venture and sort of whether that's going to have any impact at all on this? It's a wonderful question. 95% um, of any wireless network is actually a wire. 
So wireless policy and fiber policy are the same. They're interconnected. So if we bring fiber to every city in America, we can have all kinds of wireless situations that are terrific. But in the absence of the fiber feeding the towers, that isn't going to be a very high capacity connection. And it isn't going to allow someone to start a new business. So this has been a terrific discussion. Uh, there's a terrific book, I think, available for purchase <laughs> here. Yeah. Um, and there is waiting for us next door some um, beverages and some food for reception. So please join me in thanking Susan. Thank you all very much.